Um, the title, as you know, is Primary Teachers' Experiences of Inspection Beyond Ofsted Inquiry Findings. Um, I'm Dominic Wise. I'm the founding director of the Helen Hamlin Centre for Pedagogy. Um, and Alice Bradbury is the co-director. And we work together with our colleagues in the centre to further the best possible education for children in the primary and early years phases. And we often host seminars that we think are relevant to children, teachers and the profession. Today, we're going to the, the webinar will be about an hour long. Uh, in fact, I think uh, my colleague Gassam will be closing us down at five o'clock. Um, I think you may have heard, hopefully, that this is recorded and we hope that's OK and we will um, spread this through our communications channels to try and have a positive effect on um, teachers' lives. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, um, and so you can um, contribute to that through the, the Zoom, Zoom Q&A function. Um, and we follow-up inquiries can be made through the hhcp at ucl.ac.uk email address. Um, once we kind of formally end the session, you'll be sent um, an anonymous evaluation survey form. It will show on your screen. You've only got four questions. And if, if you could take a minute to complete it, it's always helpful for us for thinking about what people have experienced and what, what we can do better in future. And so to the topic of the webinar, um, I'm sure you'll all be aware that the School Inspection Service Ofsted has come under increased scrutiny. Um, some of this scrutiny caused by the tragic death of the primary head teacher, Ruth Perry. Um, and the coroner, I, I remember hearing some of the coroner's comments, and it was a ferocious and exacting um, expectation from the coroner about how Ofsted should speak to the uh, formal event and what evidence they should bring to bear. It was really interesting for me as a, someone interested in how evidence is used in policy. Um, and then in the wake of the media reports of that tragedy, the Beyond Ofsted Inquiry, funded by the NEU, began in 2023, and it included a major research project on key st stakeholders' views of Ofsted and what potential there might be for reform. And so this survey um, heard from teachers uh, in large numbers, head teachers, governors, parents, there were also focus groups carried out. Um, and so the research team who are here today will be presenting on the data um, from the primary education based participants uh, in the research, and they're going to look at some of the particularities of the inspection experience um, and, you know, views of the 2019 framework focus on curriculum, for example, the use of this idea of, quote, deep dives and problems of being inspected in primary schools by non-specialists, non-primary education uh, specialists. I'm going to finish with one personal anecdote about uh, inspection. When I began uh, my career in university in Liverpool following um, eight years as a primary school teacher, quite early on I was subject to the punitive new um, inspection system that changed from a generalised approach to looking almost exclusively at literacy and mathematics. Uh, and in the same week, not only was was I subject was my lecturing subject to uh, an observation by an Ofsted inspector, but I also had a, a parallel um, evaluation, which was a university-based national inspection system. You may not be surprised to hear that the the Ofsted version was truly appalling and politically motivated, whereas the university-based uh, one was much more professional, supportive and evidence-based. That was a long time ago. Surely things have got better. Anyway, we, we will hear from our wonderful team of researchers. And so uh, I'm handing over from me now and I look forward to listening. 
Right, thank you, Dom. Um, and welcome everyone to the uh, HHEP seminar on primary teachers' experiences of inspection. Uh, I'm Alice Bradbury, um, and I'm part of the research team led by our principal investigator, Jane Perryman, um, who, as Dom said, we did the research for this uh, inquiry called the Beyond Ofsted Inquiry. Um, it was set up to um, really establish what was going on in schools, but also to uh, formulate plans for the future. So we are going to talk a lot about what primary teachers' experiences are, but we're also going to, um, at the end, discuss what kind of alternatives might be out there, because the, very much the intention of the inquiry was to come up with some an alternative system. Um, the the um, inspection itself covered both primary and secondary, um, and it's uh, you know important to note that obviously Ofsted does have other work in other areas of um, education, early years, and so on, and in universities. Um, but the inquiry was just focused on those on those two things. Um, it was funded, as Dom said, by the National Education Union, but uh, we did our research completely independently. We were allowed to do uh, uh, do our research on our own with uh, all the normal ethical procedures and so on. So um, it's important that we state at this point that although uh, it was funded by the NEU, all of the views that we say today are our own views as researchers, not the views of um, the NEU or indeed of the Beyond Ofsted Inquiry. Um, the rest of the inquiry was uh, involved a number of experts who came together who considered our research as part of the kind of deliberations which uh, resulted in a report which came out in uh, last November. So we're going to today take it in turns to cover kind of different aspects of this talk. So um, do bear with us while we switch. Um, and as I said, there's going to be time for questions. I'm going to begin with a bit of an introduction uh, to the research. And especially if I could make the slides move. There we go. Um, and I'm going to start with this uh, quote um, about the detrimental effects of inspection outweighing the benefits. Um, and I think that really sums up how many people um, think about Ofsted in the education sector and perhaps how many people assume teachers feel. And what is quite interesting about this quote is that I actually found it in, uh, when I'm looking at the literature, and it's from 25 years ago, from an Education Select Committee report in 1999. And when I first saw this, I thought, oh, it's very interesting that, you know, very little has changed. That actually, you know, we are, we teachers say the very similar things about that balance between the positives and negatives of inspection. However, I've, I've come to think much more that actually things haven't just stayed the same, that in fact, the current inspection regime um, is particularly detrimental to primary schools and to primary heads in particular. Um, and so now perhaps that balance has shifted even more in terms of the detrimental effects really significantly outweighing the benefits. Um, of course, the context for our work, um, as Don mentioned, is, uh, the tragic death of Ruth Perry, who, um, and that really fundamentally altered, I think, the, uh, our thinking and the media discourse around inspection. She was the head teacher of Cavisham Primary School. She took her own life in um, the months after receiving an inadequate grade and an offset inspection. Um, the inquiry was actually underway already when this news broke. Um, and I think, although obviously this has significantly affected all of our thinking, um, we have to remember that the the um, concern, particularly about head teachers and the impact of Ofsted, actually was had been circulating for a number of years, a particularly intense period over the last few years, and we see that in organisations like Heads Up, who were um, and indeed the NEU, who were calling for reform uh, long before. <clears throat> um, we can see in the research, of course, that there is a kind of long history or a long-standing concern about the impact of inspection, um, particularly in Jane's work. We see um, concern about the impact on teachers, the stress, the need to perform for offset inspectors. 
the impact on workload. Um, in fact, as a research team, um, three of us have been, uh, we are all ex-teachers, three of us have been through offset inspectors ourselves and, and Katie in, in the US, the equivalent. So we do understand um, some of that uh, lived experience about having the stress and the need to kind of produce um, produce that performance on the day. Um, there's also the impact on between inspections. And I think that is one of the things that often gets um, uh, missed in looking at the system is how much pressure there is between inspections to get ready and to do things uh, just in case. It creates work in between inspections, um, creating paperwork, uh, making sure everything is prepared just in case Ofsted come. And so we get this uh, panoptic performativity, this kind of feeling of constant surveillance going on. Looking at the primary specific research, obviously that's, that issue is present in there from the research in the late 90s and 2000s, the absent presence of Ofsted. Um, but there is a kind of change, I think, in the 2010s, I've seen in my own work, where um, the reliance on data in the previous framework meant that um, Ofsted was there as a kind of uh, a driver of datification, the fact that everyone became a bit obsessed with um, outcomes. And so interestingly, although I've never done research specifically on Ofsted before, when I look back, it's always been there as a kind of shadow over the work, casting a shadow. I mean, a kind of constant presence um, affecting the decisions that teachers make, the priorities that are sort of driving um, the school. And so I've seen this, this need to produce an Ofsted story in my work with uh, Guy Roberts Holmes, the fact that you need to have data that tells a particular story for when Ofsted comes. Um, and actually, I've got some quotes here from those projects which show the kind of significance of, of um, Ofsted in everyone's thinking, the fact that you can uh, buy five years of freedom if you get your data right. Um, and being totally data driven. Um, that situation in the 2010s when data was the key part of the framework, I think was a particular situation which drove uh, a particular set of practices. What that tells us also is that the framework really matters because exactly what is happening in schools because of Ofsted is very dependent on the framework. And as I'm gonna go on to talk about when we look at our data, we really see um, how significant the shift in 2019 to focus on curriculum is because that has very particular impacts in primary schools. Um, they are smaller, they are less well-resourced um, than secondary schools. Um, and so that has a real effect on how schools are able to cope with the new framework. I'm also gonna go on to say that these experiences in fact reveal um, the under-acknowledged divide in English schooling, which is what Cauldron et al. Et al call it, um, that difference between the sectors, the difference in status. So before we go on to all of that though, I'm gonna now turn to Katie, who is gonna talk a little bit about the methods and approach that we took to this research. All right, thank you, Alice. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of the research. We started with an international comparison of inspection systems, which I'll talk about in a minute. The research itself took a mixed, mes mixed methods approach involving a national survey and focus groups. And we also drew on the expertise and insights of the advisory board for the Beyond Ofsted Inquiry, um, which comprised various people from acting heads and teachers to folks in the um, educational organization sector from the union, et cetera. We can go to the next one. All right. Um, so the first phase of research involved an international comparison of inspection systems around the world as a way to find evidence and inform potential alternatives. Um, we selected nine systems, nine countries, based on the 2018 PISA data, of course, acknowledging that, you know, there are critiques of how PISA data um, judges school quality. So those countries included China, Singapore, Estonia, Japan, South Korea, Canada, Poland, and Ireland. Uh, additionally, we looked at lower ranked countries in the UK from that PISA data. 
such as Sweden, the Netherlands, and Spain. And then we also looked at variations within the UK, so Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, to see how their inspection systems are set up. Um, when undertaking this international comparison, we really focused on when inspections are done, what inspections are assessing, the consequences of inspections on schools, as well as who is doing the inspecting, um, what evidence is gathered in the inspection process. Um, and we took all of this evidence as a way to assess um, how inspection could be done differently, as well as to see if there was a correlation between the inspection system and educational outcomes in that country. Um, an important takeaway from all of this is that there was no clear association between the type of inspection and school performance as measured by scores. There's a tremendous amount of variation across countries and how they do inspections, as well as countries that don't have a formal inspection system, such as Finland, the US. And something that was an important takeaway for us with all of the critiques of using single grade or single word judgments or grades was that none of the countries at the top of the PISA rankings were using an overall grade. Um, so that's a brief overview of some global comparisons that we looked into as the first phase. All right, so looking at the methods, um, the first part was a survey of teachers and leaders, teaching assistants, um, anyone working with schools. Um, that was taken place from the end of March to the end of May of 2023. So we gathered um, 6,708 responses. Of those responses, it was slightly skewed towards primary schools. So 65% of respondents were coming from that sector. This was followed by some focus groups um, at the NEU conference in April of 2023. There were two primary focus groups and three secondary teacher focus groups. Um, we selected a representative sample based on the type of school and grade. And then this was followed later in July of 2023 with some online focus groups where we had um, three school leader focus groups. We had a mix of local authority and MAP heads represented. There were two primary focus groups and a mixed primary and secondary one. This was largely due to summer scheduling that we had that mix. Um, and we also had two parent focus groups. And to get participants for those, we collaborated with ParentKind and the National Governance Association. Oh, I'm sorry. There were two governor focus groups as well. Um, so to give a brief overview of all of that, and I'll turn things over to Graham to go into detail. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to focus essentially mostly on the, the data that came out of the survey. So this is the, the qualitative bit and some of the criticisms and address some of the criticisms that possibly might have been made of the sample and how we went about looking at the data, but the key findings that are primarily focused on uh, primary, uh, those working in primary. Uh, I did, we have run comparisons between um, primary and secondary on the, some of the survey questions, uh, on all of the survey questions. And really there was no real difference in the quantitative, on the quantitative side in the answers to these questions. Most of the differences between primary and secondary come out in the qualitative side in the things that people talk about as motivating their feelings about uh, the negativity that they have uh, towards Ofsted. Um, the first thing to think about is the sample that we had we had a reasonable distribution of uh, the roles within the figures. 57% um, were classroom teachers. We had a slight, maybe a slight skew with fewer middle leaders than other parts of the population, the sample. That may or may not slightly in, impact on the findings, but it is that kind of the top end and the bottom end, which I think is kind of important in terms of the, the in terms of the school. More importantly, I think, is the sample distribution of the recent inspection grades, which does reflect the uh, UK profile of uh, the, which schools are great, given which grades. 
that's particularly important when it comes to considering, um, I think, the validity of the data and the negativity that's experienced by the teachers in the sample, in that these are not coming from schools that are predominated by those who have received um, what might some might regard as a negative inspection grade. Um, the majority of the sample, 87% um, of our primary school teachers are good in good or outstanding schools. So these feelings are coming from people who have been given what might they might be regarded as a positive outcome to their Ofsted experience, and yet are still experiencing it in a negative way. Um, a criticism that was raised was whether or not our sample uh, did reflect too much uh, because it was distributed from, through the NEU. Uh, somebody has been suggested that maybe it was too NEU biased and that the NEU might be, uh, these might be more politically motivated individuals. 77% of the sample were from the NEU. Uh, however, that does reflect the national membership of the NEU as a whole. So uh, I don't think we can necessarily lump all the NEU members together as having the, necessarily the same political outlook. Um, and so I think that's something that also to consider when we're going through these figures. Oh, I can say, can I have the next slide, please? That's excited me. So what is the overall experience of Ofsted? Well, 74% of it, people think that it's negative or somewhat negative. Um, and that's a significant number. So that is telling us that the experience, the discourse is a negative experience. There is a slight trend, and it was only very minuscule towards leaders seeing the outcome as slightly more positive. But given the small size of these figures, um, that slight trend is really very, very minuscule indeed. Um, and there is a slight trend, sorry, <laughs> um, to some leaders saying that if it's rated, that if you are rated as requires improvement, 93% of that group see it as negative, whereas 70% of those with good or outstanding see it as negative. So, yes, if you are given a requires improvement or a negative, um, a, a need of improvement grade, then you definitely see it as negative. But it's still at least 70% of those with a good or outstanding grade that see it as a negative experience. Um, we might have thought that if you'd had higher positive experience in good outcomes, but this is not the case. So if we can move on to the things that might contribute to that negative experience, one of the things that uh, is highlighted is this notion that Ofsted is not meant to create extra work. Uh, and is meant to be doing, you're not meant to do anything extra for Ofsted necessarily to prepare for it, uh, except all of our schools are doing a significant number of things to prepare for their Ofsted inspection. Um, I think it was something like only about 4% said the school does nothing to prepare for it. The classic, uh, the things that are done most frequently are these learning walks and book scrutinies and learning observations without grades. So at least that has changed in the new framework um, where, where the schools were often having graded lesson observations um, to prepare for Ofsted. Um, and that shift has now at least moved to individual teachers not having lesson observations with grades, uh, which might be seen as a slight positive shift. Uh, there are mock deep dives and there's a significant amount of preparation for paperwork. Uh, and lots of data meetings and lots of training on Ofsted. Clearly from the findings that we have, uh, the schools are engaged in a large number of preparatory work. Um, the question this raises, uh, I think is, is this amount of time that's being spent on this of any use? I think there is a further question that comes out of this as to whether or not this work that the school does to prepare for Ofsted, whether or not it actually has any benefit or positive effect on pupil learning, or is just focusing entirely the teacher's attention on the Ofsted grade rather than what is occurring in their classroom. And that's not a question that we ask, but it's a question that uh, is in that I think this raises as to what is the impact of all of this preparation. Uh, okay, um, and then we've got so personal perceptions of uh, people's inspection. Uh, these are kind of organized according we did uh, when we were designing the survey we explicitly put into the survey positively worded and negatively worded statements because we didn't want to create a kind of bias in that uh, the key things that came out of this was that um, people didn't feel empowered they didn't they couldn't raise their voice 
And interestingly, they, this perception that the, the inspectors do not have the necessary expertise to make their judgments. Interestingly, they agree that teachers change their normal classroom practice that increases the workload and most importantly, increases higher levels of personal stress. Um, the interesting thing is, is to think about what is it that's causing that stress? Is it the workload or is it the, uh, the, the teachers in the classroom? In the middle, we have this, I, I found an interesting thing that um, teachers were equally distributed in terms of teaching a normal lesson, but they still changed their normal classroom practice. So there's other things going on in the classroom than just doing a normal lesson. Um, and they do feel, teachers do feel that they are changing what they are doing. Um, okay, if we can do the next slide, I think. And then these are the problems with Ofsted. Uh, and this is really kind of a lack of trust within uh, the brand of Ofsted or what the Ofsted inspections are doing. Um, teachers don't see it as being a reliable arbiter of standards. Uh, and it neither is it a valid means of holding schools to account. Uh, this question of reliability, I think, from some of the other quotes that we've had from the survey, comes from teachers who've had multiple uh, inspections and seen that the kind of inspection they get often depends on the type of inspector they get, and the inspectors vary significantly. Uh, and they don't see it, therefore, as a force for improvement because they cannot trust uh, what the outcomes are of the process in some way. These teachers also seem to think that it undermines the ability of senior leaders to focus on improving the school and in the long run, therefore, creates unmanageable work levels, which introduces harmful burdens into the school system. I get the next slide, I think. Um, and then some of the work that I myself and Jane have done on uh, retention and in the light of this retention, the potential retention crisis in teaching uh, is the effect that Ofsted has on uh, retention and career plans. And it is having a significant um, effect on teachers. One, one, they don't think it gives them any skills that are useful to apply for other jobs, but two, it does want them to leave uh, to, to think about leaving education. Whether or not they actually put that into practice, I, I don't know, but we can say that lots of these teachers are unhappy with being in their schools and that is not going to have a positive effect on their outcomes in the long run. Um, and also, if the, there was an interesting finding that if the school did, does get a negative grade, the teachers want to, to leave that school as well. Um, and there is kind of, but they do, they do kind of, they don't really want to stay in their current role either. And that's the overall effect of Ofsted. Uh, okay, I think that I've got one more. Um, and doing inspections differently. Uh, these were the kinds of uh, things that came out from the, the survey. The key focus was on looking at legal requirements um, and leadership and quality and the curriculum. And the things that came out at the bottom were learning outcomes and curriculum delivery and possibly governance. Um, and I think the last, I've got one more. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, from the, the survey itself and the, the quantitative data, we can say, unsurprisingly, perhaps given the, the discourse of inspection, it is viewed negatively. There was no real difference in the quantitative data between primary and secondary. Um, the sources of differences, as I said, appear in the qualitative. Slight tendency for senior leaders to be less negative um, and a general view that inspection is not necessary in this form. Looking at the the what we can take away from this, I think you can think that there is a lack of trust in the judgments and it detracts from the job of doing the teacher uh, and isn't seen as helping teachers do that job. And in the long run, deprofessionalizes the teacher. Uh, so I will now hand over to Jane, who... I think it's going to look at the other bits of data. Thank you. No, I'm afraid it's me again. <laughs> so, so I'm going to um, talk about the uh, findings and I've got, got findings in common to all teachers and then findings that are specific to primary and with a focus on the latter. Um, so in this section, beginning with the findings that are common to all the teachers, uh, first of all, I've got some quotes, and these are all from the uh, written comments on the survey. 
from the focus groups uh, with primary teachers and primary leaders. Um, so first of all, I think it's really important to emphasize that point which Graham has highlighted from the quantitative data about the incredible levels of stress, stress and anxiety. Um, and often this has a kind of very visceral kind of um, description. This teacher talks about being on their knees. Um, and it's very clear from this quote, you know, that if impact of waiting and waiting, particularly people who've been waiting for a very long time for their offset inspection to come, um, having an impact on the staff, on the children, um, and on behavior, and even on parents. There was also related to that, the impact um, as we've seen in the, that data about between inspections, um, about paperwork. So an awful lot of uh, paperwork was being done purely for Ofsted, for no purpose for children's learning or to help teachers. And even in this case, this is where um, the Ofsted have said they don't need to see planning, but the head teacher has decided that um, they do need to have all their planning ready just, to, uh, just in case Ofsted do want it. Um, and so it really is just for Ofsted. Um, and this is very reflective of this kind of performative culture of fear. Uh, you're never really certain how you're going to be judged. Um, and it's it's what um, Erin Bergel has called hypervigilant enactment. It's being so uncertain and so fearful of the outcomes that you do a lot of work just in case. Um, so you're kind of hypervigilant because of your, of your fear. Um, the next one is the problem of the one word judgment. Um, again, that's in primary and secondary in the data. Um, and it's talked about a great deal and uh, in terms of the debates. And I, I do worry sometimes that we get a bit fixated on the one word judgment and how if we might, if we change that, everything will be OK. Um, but the, the heads in particular talked about the problem with the one word judgment um, in a context where there are falling roles in primary schools, um, financial difficulty for many. Um, that having that judgment of good and all outstanding really is, is the way to survive as a school. So this head talks about, um, you know, getting um, bums on seats, getting the money and then that school succeeding. Um, so actually that one word, great one word grading is not helpful in any way, shape or form, which is pretty clear. The feeling is that schools are just too complicated. You can't, they're too nuanced. You can't distill it into one into one grade. And of course, the one word judgment is um, causes a great deal of fear because the head teachers worry that you can't. Get to put across everything that they're good at, the complexity of a school, if it makes you um it makes you feel like the whole system is unfair. So those are the ones that we found very much in common with the other teachers, um, the secondary teachers, but I want to focus a little bit more specifically on primary. Um, and we've done this analysis by looking at the primary qualitative data. And it's interesting that for many of these things, there really isn't an equivalent problem in secondary. It's not that they have their own set of problems, it's that primary seem to be dealing with some additional problems. The first one is um, about unrealistic demands. So the current curriculum framework, which is set up to focus on curriculum, sorry, the current inspection framework is set up to uh, look at, at curriculum. Curriculum responsibility in primary schools is spread across um, all of the staff, usually have curriculum leads, and in some schools, every teacher will be a lead for one of the 14 national curriculum subjects. Some schools, if you've got a very small staff, you may have teachers who are looking after multiple subjects. The head teacher may be looking after subjects. You may have um, early career teachers looking after subjects. So it is very much not equivalent to the head of department role in a secondary school. You don't get any extra pay or any extra uh, time often for curriculum leadership unless it's in English or maths. And so the demands that the curriculum framework, which we do these deep dives when inspectors come, are really seen as inappropriate and unrealistic, given the time and expertise of the curriculum needs in primary schools. So we get this um, constant discussion in the um, qualitative data about how unrealistic it is to expect primary schools to be able to manage um, that kind of level of inspection. Um, and the underlying feeling, as you'll see throughout this data, is that the entire system is this one size fits all framework is just unrealistic for primary schools because it is based on a secondary model. 
Um, this head, I think, is a good example. He was head of two very small primary schools in a rural area, and he was the lead for six subjects across those schools. So if in the inspectors um, came, he says, you know, I can't possibly manage the deep dives in six different things. It's really, it's flawed and it doesn't work for all of the schools. And I think that also points to the problem, of course, that primary schools in themselves vary hugely. A framework that is for all of secondary and all of primary is very problematic, given that you are trying to inspect a small rural primary with 50 children in exactly the same way as you are inspecting a large secondary with 2,000 children. So related to that, we get this general lack of recognition of the size and type of the school. Um, this deep dives where they look into a lot of detail in one curriculum area are seen as uh, ridiculous. Um, it's just seen as inappropriate. And that leads to a great deal of stress as we see from this teacher who is a curriculum lead, a subject lead, and she is under pressure and feeling that she hasn't done her job properly, but she also feels the tension saying, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm not a subject lead. I mean, she technically is, but she's feeling that, you know, she isn't, hasn't got the skills to do this job. And that puts her under a lot of pressure. Um, the other problem is, of course, as, as I've said, that you end up being responsible as a curriculum lead for the entire curriculum from early years to year six. And actually that's a great deal of expertise that you need in how to teach one particular subject for all of those different age groups. Um, you've got to know the ins and outs of all the subjects. And really, um, you know, as this teacher says, it makes them feel under the cosh, under a huge amount of pressure. So that leads us then into this um, final point about the problem of inspectors and their expertise. Um, that was seen as a, a, a real sticking point by many of the teachers who felt that inspectors who are trained in secondary education just do not have the knowledge and understanding of primary and early years pedagogy to be able to make any kind of accurate judgment. So they talk about uh, teachers, inspectors not getting it, um, and then in this second one about inspectors making inaccurate claims. And of course, that really affects people's confidence in the judgments that are being made. Um, and underlying that, I think it also really builds this resentment. So this, head this senior leader here talks about um, an inspector with a background in EYFS should not be carrying out deep dives in secondary geography, for example. And yet the vice, the opposite is, is possible. So you can get secondary trained inspectors coming in and making judgments on early years. And that really feeds into this feeling of a difference in status and as if the kind of expertise of primary um, is not really recognized as a particular kind of set of, um, set of knowledge and skills. There's also this sheer problem about leadership and size. So uh, this head teacher talks about, um, you know, she is probably the only member of a senior leadership team in her small school. Um, you don't have a lot of responsibilities and roles split across numbers of people. So it leads to this immense amount of pressure, particularly on the head. Um, and again, she goes on to talk about the primary school model. Um, it's being set up with a secondary school model rather than a primary school one. And she goes on to blame the government and says, actually, I, as this happens again and again, it's being all based on what we see in secondary without understanding the difference between um, secondary and primary. So just summing up our um, this bit of the qualitative data, uh, we can see that having this single inspection framework is seen as particularly um, unrealistic. It puts this uh, huge burden on primary teachers, especially the uh, curriculum leaders. Um, there is a feeling of lack of confidence due to inspectors' expertise. Um, and as I said, a feeling of resentment. Um, and a feeling that it is unfair and inappropriate to fail to take into account the local context, the size of the school, when um, assessing the quality of education in, in, um, in primary. Of course, you know, I think we do have to remember that primary schools have been under an immense amount of um, pressure in the last five years because of the COVID inquiry, because of the cost of living crisis, and one of the things I think I've certainly seen in my other research 
on food banks, for example, and in the work we did um, during the COVID crisis, is that head teachers in particular have uh, a real sense of responsibility for their schools and a real sense of kind of really close relationships with their community and their pupils, which I think adds to that feeling of pressure um, when you are going to be labelled with one uh, one word judgment. Um, there's also the problem of falling roles, which again makes puts extra pressure on that one word to uh, recruit students. And of course, the financial pressures that occur if you don't uh, recruit students. But I think we can um, see the inspection framework as adding to those additional pressures. Um, we can definitely conclude that it has become another way in which this, this durable inequality between primary and secondary um, operates. It's become symbolic of it, but it also, I would argue, reinforces it because it has made uh, primary schools feel and appear to be uh, inadequate, in, particularly in terms of their curriculum leadership, and fostered that, uh, that resentment um, about the difference in status, which has been there for a very long time. And that inequality, I would argue, is pretty damaging to the education sector as, as a whole. Um, next, we're going to turn slightly more optimistically to uh, thinking about our plans for reform, which was obviously a very kind of key part of the inquiry. Jane. Thank you, Alice. Um, yes, I mean, half of the work of, of the inquiry was actually about looking at alternatives, um, which was kind of for us the most interesting thing because there wasn't really much that surprised us of, of, of what teachers actually thought about inspection. Um, so as Graham said earlier, we asked teachers in the survey for their opinions on alternatives to inspection, which was based on that global review. Um, and the top four results are there. Um, teachers were, were happy that, that schools should be helped to identify strengths and weaknesses um, and it should be about making sure children ha have access to high quality education um, and raising standards. Um, there was also a, a, a real recognition of the importance of, of safeguarding, which is currently conducted by inspection. However, 79% of respondents wanted this to happen via a complete overhaul of how inspections work. There was no sense that they, they just wanted to tinker around a bit and make it a little bit more friendly. Um, most of respondents wanted it to completely change. And they talked about removing grades, uh, moving towards a more high trust and, and supportive viewpoint rather than the current punitive way it's, it's seen as. Um, and there was just a strong desire for change, including calls for an immediate pause, which um, sadly doesn't seem to have happened. So we took um, the teachers' views and we uh, spoke to the advisory board. We also spoke to focus groups later on about some of our ideas for change. And we came up with the following set of recommendations. Next slide, please. So um, essentially, um, uh, the proposal of the inquiry is that um, direct inspection is actually removed from schools. Instead, schools conduct their own self-evaluations, which we're calling the School Performance Review, SPR. And the point of this, this uh, School Performance Review is to report to the stakeholders, so the parents and the community, not to government or to inspectors. Um, what the School Performance Review will comprise of um, I think it would be designed uh, through consultation with the sector. Some of it would be mandatory and some of it would be more optional and, and contextual, which would get away from this, this whole issue of, of uh, primary schools having to do what secondary schools do when it's not necessarily appropriate. Um, we're also recommending um, that schools work with external school improvement partners, SIPs, um, who will deliver on an action plan informed by, by the, um, the SPR. Um, these people would be experts, they would be probably typically be experienced in school leadership and improvement, including serving her teachers, but they would not, and we repeat, not be inspectors. They would, it would be very much that model of, of a collegiate, helpful um, friend who would be helping the school improve. Um, and then safeguarding audits, we recommend, will be conducted annually by a separate body and be separated out from any inspection system. There was a feeling that safeguarding is too important to leave to sporadic inspections done by non-experts. 
Um, obviously, there would need to be funding to go into, into local authorities and trust to support this work, but uh, it would be an annual um, safeguarding audit, nothing to do with inspection. So what's happening to the inspectors, I hear you ask? Um, the role of inspectors would change so that they focus on governance and capacity for school improvement. So they would not be directly going into schools and looking at lessons. They would be looking at how, for example, local authorities and trusts manage school improvement of their schools. So um, the inspection system would be would be not punitively in individual schools, but looking more systemically. The inspectors would be trained to do this and they would also be expected to develop and maintain expertise in the area of school improvement and also in whatever school area that they're, they're looking at. So primary trained inspectors would be looking at primary trusts and primary local authority schools. Um, we also recommend the inspector will be fully independent of government um, so that you can hold the government to account. Um, I think most people seem to value their thematic inspections um, and research pro uh, projects. And there was a sense that rather than the inspectorate being a top-down government inspector's school, that the inspectors should be able to speak back to the government about what schools say about the effects of their policies. And in order to do all this, um, one of the, the, the most important recommendations, as I've already said, is that we wanted to have an immediate pause to inspection, which, um, as we all know, happened for a little bit, but sadly is now ongoing. And that's it. Well, thank you all very much indeed. Um, I haven't heard that detail directly from you. And so for me, it was really fascinating. Um, we've got uh, four questions lined up. Um, I'm going to, there's one um, that I'm going to hold on to and maybe give you just a few more seconds to think about, which is to do with whether what is perceived as a narrow focus on cognitive science in relation to the school curriculum is having an undue emphasis on, on Ofsted inspectors thinking, but I'll leave that one for a moment. Um, and I'll start with one which probably is a relatively quick answer. Maybe Jane, you could have a go at this one. Um, can you say what percentage of pa participants had experienced an inspection in the past five years and are therefore speaking from experience, although that may require a delving around in the the answers. But I'll what do you think of that one? We do have that that statistic. Um I've just, I've just, I've just looked for it. I was just looking at the questions now. Um and I'm going to send it as a written answer. Um 90% of the sample had experienced the new framework. Um and but eight percent had only experienced the new framework. So there's there's the majority of our sample have experienced both the new and the old frameworks, but I will send those figures as an answer as well. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, and a different topic then before we return to um, cognition. Um, uh, Gemma Moss asks the question, is the problem with the deep dive that it presumes you teach one subject at a time not through, for example, integrated project work. Um, so I'm not sure who wants to begin um, on that one. Yeah, I think I think that's an interesting question because um, it does rather suggest that curriculum subjects are completely discrete within primary. Um, and but as we know that they often aren't um, in practice. And um, I don't know whether uh, there is any kind of relationship between what Ofsted, kind of the way in which Ofsted operates and schools therefore doing subjects more separately because it's it's then clearer and easier to see progression. Um, we don't really know that. Um, but that is, I, I agree with Gemma, I think that is a bit of a, a tension because it comes from a place of of assuming that subjects are completely separate and, and they aren't. Um, so it would be quite interesting, actually, to explore whether schools feel like that, that that does need to be separate. I do know that the kind of focus on separate subjects in early years has been seen as quite problematic because 
um, if you're going to track a particular subject from early years right the way through to year six and talk about the progression, it means that you need to have to sort of isolate the bits of early years, which are, say, history or geography. And that isn't very easy to do where the knowledge and understanding of the world covers all of that. So you get this ridiculous situation where early years teachers are having to write progression maps for um, for how children are learning history in early years, which don't really often make much sense or, um, you know, you, they, they aren't, it doesn't really work like that. So they become these kind of documents that are just done for Ofsted. Um, but yeah, that's a very interesting question about whether it, it reproduces that idea of, of, of discrete subjects. Thanks. Um, then, so I'll come back. I'll read in full, I think. Polar England asked this question in relation um, to cognitive science. I'll read it in full because there are a lot of issues that are not only relevant to how inspectors view primary education, but, but it's, this is clearly an issue in teacher education as well. So um, she says, I'm interested to see if teachers talk much about the coercive impacts of Ofsted's narrow focus on cognitive science on the impact of school curriculum development. This for me is a huge issue as I'm encountering leaders binning excellent child-focused pedagogy in favour of very narrow formulaic classroom practice that seems to be driven by the recommendations of very shaky and poorly evidenced ideas coming out of cognitive science. I saw this creeping in as a lecturer at UOB School of Education, and now I'm seeing it at the sharp end as a deputy head in a school. Did it come up much? I don't mind who answers. <laughs> Again, I, that's, that's an interesting question because it is something that obviously is in the political debate about uh, ITE and kind of reliance on cognitive science, but it wasn't mentioned at all in, the, um, in any of our data. Um, if I can remember rightly. So I am I think that that may be something that um, hasn't sort of filtered through quite uh, into people's complaints, maybe quite as much. Um, but it's obviously a very kind of difficult issue, isn't it? If people are thinking that they have to change their pedagogy in order to align with Ofsted, that it becomes another step further than just doing all the preparation um, and kind of performing on the day, if they're also changing quite fundamental things about their school because they feel they have to align with cognitive science, for example, then I think that would be a very kind of concerning um, influence. But it feeds into the bigger debate, I would say, about um, the role of cognitive science and, and the role of all kind of um, ideas from kind of translations of neuroscience and, and so on into education, which are often, I, I would see as quite problematic. Um, and especially when the kind of misuse of things to determine how we teach. Um, but I would like to hear more from Paula yeah. really at some point actually about how that how that's working in her school. Brilliant, thank you. I'm keeping an eye on the clock. We've, we've got um, about eight minutes left and there are six questions lined up. So, um, Katie, you may be able to have first go at this one. Um, Ali Coleman says, fascinating research, thank you. Were you able to segment the data to see the extent of variation between differing historic school judgments? Was there any intensification of the negative comments or were these equally distributed across the sample? You showed the negative views were held across the sample at the beginning, but I wondered if this played out in a particular way for schools identified as RI or inadequate. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so certainly in the quantitative data, we saw a kind of an overall negative trend, but really it was in the qualitative data where the disproportionate impact on RI or um, inadequate schools really came through. Um, so we saw a lot of issues surrounding kind of a vicious cycle of the Ofsted grade impacting on you know teacher retention, having pupils recruited, as well as uh, morale and just kind of that impact of being perpetually under surveillance um, by Ofsted. They also commented a lot on kind of how it further marginalized their school and their students as they were kind of grappling for resources and kind of maintaining some sense of positive momentum in school improvement. Um, so certainly the schools with RI or inadequate grades commented on kind of a lack of support 
inherent in Austin inspections and a very punitive nature that they felt disproportionately through um, their kind of experiences. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, um, Jane, maybe this one for you. Sally Bone says, how do mats fit into the picture? Our, in inverted commas, supportive inspections from MAT officials feel worse than Ofsted. Oh, Sally, I, I feel your pain. Um, obviously, um, this came through in the, in the data, particularly from, from people in MATS. Um, I think the idea is um, that because the pressure, um, the pressure to the pressure to perform would be on the on the mats themselves. Obviously, they would then be asking schools to perform for them in order to demonstrate improvement, but it wouldn't kind of be so direct. Um, but I think I think it would be a question of um, educating and training people on the new system so that the whole basis of it is, is a more um, trusting and supportive regime for teachers. But um, yes, good question. And sadly, we don't know. And Holly Berman has asked a related point, which probably you, you've answered. It's about um, whether placing more emphasis on direct inspection of maths, maths will mean more pressure on teachers as they add even more burdensome workload to get through the process and filtering down and so on. I can't imagine it would be more. Um, it's possible that it would still be the same. Yeah, thanks. Um, and then Anel Mustafina says, do school leaders and teachers experience the same amount of bureaucracy and paperwork um, for us to preparation? I'm maybe not so clear on what the, the actual question is, whether that, oh, is it maybe do the leaders experience as much pressure as the teachers? Maybe that's the question there. I mean, I, it's, yeah, sorry, go on, go on, Graham. Probably answer that in that we did I did we did run comparisons between the different roles in the organization and see whether or not there was any differences in any of these. And really there isn't any. So um on the quantitative side, you can say that everybody is experiencing high levels of paperwork and burdens and paperwork. Um what that paperwork is may differ, um, and that would be something that a qualitative question would answer. But at least we know that everybody is experiencing the same kinds of burdens and paperwork. Thank you. Uh, Charlotte Vidal Hall says, to what extent do you think that much of the tension stroke extra workload may come from what schools think Ofsted wants rather than what Ofsted actually asked for? The, the example of planning you gave would seem to support this. Mm. Yeah, I think that may be one of the big issues really is that it's often about fear of what Ofsted might work, want, the uncertainty, the kind of... Um, trying to anticipate what Ofsted are going to need um, that causes a lot of paperwork. And, um, you know, Ofsted do try and kind of put out their myth buster thing, saying, you know, we aren't going to ask this, we aren't going to ask that. But, um, you know, schools do struggle to kind of um, really kind of manage that those problems about expectations. And there are, of course, all these uh, courses and, and things that people do about getting your school ready for Ofsted, how to prepare and so on. So there's a whole kind of industry about Ofsted preparation as well, which I think also contributes to that, that feeling of, of needing to do everything just in case. Mm. Uh, Guy Roberts Holmes says, why would the government embrace self-evaluation as the whole edifice of new public management, which Ofsted is part of, is based on a deep lack of trust? Go on, Jane. I think our recommendations were based um, in the hope that perhaps a new government might be ready to embrace change. I mean, there is, I think this, it's so linked with the uh, the retention and recruitment crisis in, in teaching at the moment, that um, I don't think governments can afford just to ignore this, this overwhelming discourse of how awful it is. And something does need to be done. And perhaps a new government might be prepared to look at that, even mm. if it was a uh, new public management type of new government. Uh, Wendy Scott says, I wonder about the impact of inconsistency in inspectors' experience and qualifications, and also the very short time spent in schools, especially when a single inspector is involved. Again, these are all the things that people mention in terms of, um, you know, their lack of, of faith in the, in the outcomes. And I think 
that kind of really gets to the heart of why people are, feel Ofsted is so toxic is that if you if the whole thing is so damaging and then you don't trust the outcome um then then there are no positives at all really within the entire system so mm. um that kind of lack of of um lack of uh feeling of of trust and accuracy in the judgments i think is really important i would just say on the issue about why would the government bring something new in is that i think there is a, a groundswell of opinion also amongst parents that the system is not working and that it's damaging to the education system and that of course is a large proportion of the electorate and politically it may be wise in order to change Ofsted um, or appear to change Ofsted at least in order to be uh, look like you are reforming the education system and I mean we had you know quite a lot of political involvement with the outcomes of the inquiry and, and certainly I think there is intention among from the Labour Party to change the system so what remains to be seen, of course, is is how much it changes and in in whether the outcomes are, you know, what perhaps what we would want in terms of the impact on teachers or whether we just shift into a whole new set of pressures in, in working in slightly different ways. Mm. I would like to take the two final questions, if that's OK. It'll take us slightly over five. The very final question I'll save because it broadens us out again is about what impacts there might be of one of your recommendations on the work that governors do. But the but the firstly, uh, Michelle Jacks says, um, your recommendations aim to disrupt the dominance of Ofsted to disperse the negatives such as stress and anxiety. Recognizing some benefits exist from a proportion of stress, does your evidence suggest at what point uh, in the experience of inspection, a manageable amount of stress becomes something that overwhelms? Um, I think that um, obviously there was lots in the data about um, particular experiences of inspection which had um, caused people to have stress and go off work and everything like that. But there's also lots in the data about ongoing stress, which which happens the entire time between inspections. People talking about suddenly being able to breathe on a Wednesday morning when the call hasn't come. And it's just ongoing. Mm. Um before the, the last question, just a reminder to everyone uh, listening, if you could complete um, the survey before you leave the virtual room, that would be great once it comes up on screen. Final question is from uh, Chris Merritt. Will the recommendation that inspectors focus on governance and their capacity for bringing about improvement make it even harder to find volunteers to become governors? Yes, yes, in short, yes, we are concerned about that. And it was one of the issues brought up um, when we talked about the role of governing bodies um, within within the whole system is that, you know, it is difficult to recruit governors and they sometimes don't have very much knowledge or expertise of the system and trying to rely on them to, um, uh, you know, recruit, um, for example, a school improvement partner would be a real struggle in, in some in some places. So, yes, the role of governors, I think, is another kind of part of the puzzle, which certainly needs to be uh, to be thought about very um, carefully. Hmm. Uh, before we go, Dom, can I just say thank you very much to Hassan and Monica for their excellent organisation and yes. and to the other members of the research team for our presentations today, for their presentations. Today. And thank you all. Um very much for your talks, for the work you've done. It's so important, I think, that we really do um, subject these kind of major system processes to proper independent scrutiny. Um, thank you to everyone who's been listening and what a great set of questions, a very varied and really to the point, which is, which is wonderful. So I'm gonna hand, say goodbye, uh, hand back to Gassam for the just the, final survey and so on. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, John.